how big data is turning the world into a global business and how to change this. The world is confronted with a number of really complicated problems, climate change, financial crisis, conflict and war, for example. And a couple of years ago, we came up with a proposal of a very ambitious project called Future ICT. It was running for a one billion euro grant. And the idea was to build a number of systems, such as a planetary nervous system that would collect data about the world around us, a living earth simulator that would use these data basically to calculate what might happen, what are alternative scenarios, and also a global participatory platform that would create opportunities for everyone. It was a highly sophisticated project, and actually ethics was at the heart of this project, very important. We raised <laughs> awareness all over the world. We created an interdisciplinary community in many countries, many continents, in fact, and all of that started in Italy. Back in 2008, there was an OECD Global Science Forum on Complex International Public Policy, and I saw already the financial crisis coming, and I said, you know, we need something like a knowledge accelerator or a follow project to understand our society and our economy. And in fact, then we came up with this visionary project. And already in 2010, we warned the world that this financial crisis could get totally out of hand and it would endanger in the end social and political instability, uh, stability and peace and our cultural achievements. And very unfortunately, in the meantime, that has become pretty much true. We've demanded a new financial system, and we said we need to build a resilient financial system, economy, and society that would be able to stop cascading effect that would otherwise destroy our economy and society. We've published many books brochures about complexity science, and many in a nature paper about all this. Scientific American reported about it, and also a book about big data took up this idea of the planetary nervous system right in the four words, and people liked it a lot, so that was the leading project at that time, but then it was turned down. And I was wondering, you know, what, what was going on there, actually? Um, and I thought that something is going wrong. Something is going terribly wrong, and I was starting to warn the world that information systems would be used actually to control people. And in fact, the paradigm behind this is phantom panoptical, right? So that's a concept that has been created actually for the perfect prism. There would be a person, a prison guard, that could see into all the different cells and see what everyone is doing in this way, actually have perfect control of everyone. And such kinds of prisons have been built, and the concept has also been spread, actually, to be used for our entire world. And in fact, you know, if you look at uh, this building over here, which you know from the British Secret Service, you know, it looks pretty much like a panoptical. Uh, there are other buildings like this too, also by big IT companies. And this is very concerning. And in fact, some awareness was created by Edward Snowden, who has pointed out that there was a global surveillance going on now in the world. But it's not just about surveillance and finding terrorism. You know. This is about our future, everyone's future your future, because it seems what they're trying to do is to build a world government based on all that data that has been secretly collected about us, and apparently this has been built at CERN. And the justification for this is actually that the world is running into trouble, the UN has decided about global development goals, until 2030 we need to achieve these goals. And a lot of this is about uh, 
the lack of sustainability in our world. So we're overusing resources. We've actually hit planetary boundaries. And so we cannot sustain the way of living that we have today. Actually, this is already known since the 1960s, right? 60s, 70s, I think 70s actually, um, where the Club of Rome came up with this limit to growth study. It was controversially discussed. People didn't believe that we would see future economic and population collapse, and it was unavoidable. That's what that study said. And so, the Clinton Commission, this global 2000 study, we have his own scientists look into the problem and they came to very similar conclusions. And this is basically what the Limit to Growth study says that, you know, over here we'll be running into a population crisis and before we would be running into a crisis of our society and economy. So global collapses impending, they say. And we couldn't talk about it because it's so terrible that we shouldn't know about it. The public would panic, and of course it doesn't panic. But you know, a lot of things have happened behind our backs. The question is, is the situation really serious? Well, if you look at these pictures, you get the impression, well, actually, we are in trouble. Things have changed in a negative way. We are running into shortages of water, of phosphorus, and nitrogen, that means food production. And it's not so clear, actually, what's the carrying capacity of the Earth in particular, if we want to reduce also the consumption of oil, coal, and gas, right? So how many people will be able to live in the future? How many people would die? And so, of course, scientists, engineers, companies, politicians that are trying to solve this problem, and one of the approaches was big data. Within just one minute, uh, 700,000 Google queries are being sent, 500,000 Facebook posts, and as you go shopping, as you move, all that creates digital traces that are being collected, and of course, this data can be used for good, no question. And governments have collected huge amounts of data, every government, and a lot of companies too, and all of that was driven by Chris Anderson's dream. He said, basically, that we don't like to need science anymore in the future. If we just had enough data, quantity of data would turn into quality, garbage in, garbage out, would not be a problem anymore, and the truth would basically reveal itself. The data would tell us what needs to be done. And then we would just have to do it, right? So the idea of the data more than the data was born. And governments felt they had the obligation, basically, to build such a system and just to do what data would tell them. The idea came up that uh, we can now know everything, that we can build a crystal ball and that we can now optimize the world and rule it like a wise king or a better modern dictator. Well, that sounds quite plausible. I can imagine why a politician bought that story, but it's not that simple. Because the wise king or the better modern dictator could easily make mistakes, and he's if you supply one approach, one solution to the entire world, that would be a big mistake. You know? This magic formula that more data means more knowledge, more knowledge means more power, more power means more success, sounds very plausible. Unfortunately, it's not an equation. It doesn't always hold. And one of the reasons is that there are spurious correlations that you find in the data, like this one, number of serial killers is a function of chocolate consumption. <laughs> if that was true, you know, it would be very dangerous to live in Switzerland. You'd have to lock away all people who eat a lot of chocolate. <laughs> Just to be on the safe side. And in fact, you know, data science is not that easy. As we find now, there's a replication crisis in science, and sophistic is quite, uh, statistics is quite sophisticated. In fact, 
the more data you have, the more patterns will be in the data. Uh, just as a side effect of randomness. If you look into the skies and you see a lot of patterns in the stars, but most of them don't have a scientific meaning. Same happens with big data, right? <clears throat> but most of these correlations are not causal relationships that would be meaningful and useful. So finding those powerful causal relationships is like finding the rare good uh, grain of truth, like finding gold, and this doesn't happen very often. There is another application of big data, which is to separate good and bad risks. You know, banks want to do that, insurance companies want to do that, governments want to do that. They want to know, are you a terrorist or are you a good citizen? But unfortunately, data clouds are overlapping, and therefore there will be errors of first kind and of second kind. False alarms that go off where they shouldn't go off, and alarms that don't go off where they should. We've seen that actually in the failure to fight terrorism in a number of cases, even though suspects were on terror list. And we've seen also that there are a number of problems that we didn't anticipate. Of course, we always believed that data would be objective, right? Now it turns out that they discriminate certain groups of people, like women, like colored people, and this promise that now big data which turned the world into a paradise on Earth has yet come true. Now, if that was true, then we would expect that the most livable cities in the world are in the big IT nations. But that's actually not true. They're in different nations. And the question is, what are we doing wrong in the way we use now, currently, big data itself doesn't do the job. So, with artificial intelligence, help, right? Now, we have an explosion of computational power. Moore's law says it doubles every 18 months. So, it's expected that within, um, say, 40 years, uh, computers would ex actually um, become more powerful than the human brain. Some people think it will be in 100 years. Some people think it will be in five years and maybe it's already happened. You know? But anyway, so we know that computers are better chess players in so many years. The robots are better workers in many areas. They're not getting tired, they're not complaining, they don't have to pay taxes and all this. So they might be better drivers, um, better doctors. IBM like Watson is very good at uh, coming up with a diagnosis of your diseases and better in answering questions, those questions that have answers already. So why are people like Elon Musk so nervous about artificial intelligence? He says that I think we should be very careful about artificial intelligence. If I had to guess at what our biggest existential threat is, it's probably that. And I don't think he was talking about this Thai chatbot created by Microsoft that was turning into a Nazi business just today, which showed us that artificial intelligence is not impartial and objective and rational, but it can be manipulated and deceived like every human too. I think the reason why he got worried about artificial <coughs> intelligence is that now people are thinking about running society like a giant machine. And so the idea is basically well, we just need to know whether all the pieces, you know, people, companies, institutions, and so on, all of these pieces, how they behave, and then learn how they can be manipulated, how they can be made to do certain kind of things. And this is what I'm discussing in my new book, The Automation of Society is Next. But then I compare two scenarios of automation top-down control, and bottom-up self-organization. Now anyway, after the automation of production and driving the automation of society since next, IBM Watson has been proposed for president, and Google wants to reprogram the state. That means they are creating an 
operating system for society. Not just for computers and for smartphones. For a society that needs to operate you to program people. That's what it means. And the military is working on this. And why should we be for it? Because people like Larry Page have to set such things. He said, there are a lot of things you'd like to do. Unfortunately, we can't do them because they're illegal. Now, anyway, how would this world work? So, you use machine learning such as deep learning, and you feed these algorithms with your data that has been secretly collected about you to learn about your behavior, what you're doing, why you're doing it, and how you can be manipulated. And Google was one of the companies who brought that to protection for personalized advertisement. They do millions of experiments to find out you know, how you can be made to click a certain link to buy a certain kind of product and all this. And it's about steering your attention, your emotions, your thinking, your opinions, your decision making, and your behavior. And to some extent, it seems to work for you. And pictures like these, you know, it looks like people are already remotely controlled to some extent. In fact, Google has a large manipulation power around the world. As you can see, like uh, North America, South America, Europe, India, Australia, it's basically Google country. And it's interesting that uh, TISA, the global agreement between the United States and all these countries is basically clearing the way for such a governance approach. So, in other words, politics has become interested in this personalized information to steer your behavior. And there is called nudging. To combine it with big data about your personal behavior is called big nudging. It's so sophisticated that you won't notice that you're being manipulated feels like your own decision. And the program behind is basically conditioning people's behaviors as it has been done with dogs and other animals in Skinner's box. So by providing you with certain rewards and punishment, they're trying to make you do certain kind of things. And our Skinner box is basically the filter bubble that's being created around you which is a world of information that's tailored to your personality. Now, it doesn't seem to hurt, right? It feels quite comfortable, but unfortunately it makes it much more difficult to sink out of the box. That means to be really innovative. But that's what we need to be doing. We need to come up with innovations that would solve the problems that we have in our world. Otherwise, we'll fail. Then the next question is, would we be punished? And the answer is yes, most likely so. Because this nudging is actually not as efficient as they would like it to be. So we won't all be slim in a year from now. We won't be all nice people that hug trees and uh, <laughs> actually protect the environment and all this. So stronger tools are needed such as personalized pricing, and actually the citizen score. Citizen score is being tested already in China, and uh, of course many companies are applying similar principles. And it's basically giving you plus or minus points for everything that you do or don't do, and it determines your future jobs, where you can travel, how much you have to pay for your loan, and actually also what your friends, your family, your neighbors, your colleagues are doing is also being uh, calculated in. And there would be predictive policing. So basically, if you were to spin up on a dictator, you know, you would basically figure out what are the scenarios that I can do and who would oppose those political scenarios and you would want to take those people out so they couldn't oppose. And I would take into account also the people who are influencing you, and those people would be put to prison, basically. 
And we already have today a situation where Eric Holder has warned that too many Americans go to too many prisons for far too long and for no truly good law enforcement reasons. We know that this is currently actually producing a lot of public outcry and social unrest in the United States. So our society is now at a crossroad. No question, our society will be run based on data. And that's OK. But there are different possibilities of database societies. And that's why we need to make up our mind to take a decision. So we could build fascism to the toe, a brave new world society. We could build communism to the toe, this benevolent dictator society. Or we could build feudalism to the toe, surveillance capitalism. All those models are on the way in different places of the world. And it's concerning that some people say democracy is an outdated technology that has created health, wealth, and happiness of billions of people, but now we want to do something else. Period. You know? And this is happening. This is happening in Hungary, it's happening in Turkey, it's happening in Poland, it's happening in France, and we can feel it's happening in other countries too. And it's all based on that misunderstanding of Chris Anderson. In fact, it turns out, but I don't want to hear this, that this is not creating a superior society. If you look at Hungary, as compared to other Eastern European countries, you know, they start as the leading country, it ended up as last. So I'm warning you, we may lose what we built over hundreds of years. Self-determination, freedom, human dignity, assumed innocence, fairness, pursuit of happiness, pluralism, democracy, participation, all this just because this idea is that the benevolent dictator would come up with a better solution for the world. This is not true. If it was true, you know, we have big data already around for some time, then the world should be in a much better shape. But our existential problems, you know, climate change, financial crisis, uncivil peace, and all this, unemployment, it has been solved. It has become worse, actually, over time. What they did instead is they came up with something like public sedation, you know, bread and circuses. So we get food, obviously, and we get entertainment. So we're being distracted. And I'm not the only one who's critical about this. You know, the Pope has criticized this. Um, Obama has criticized this. In his speech recently, he said, this is also the time around the world when some of the fundamental ideals of liberal democracies are under attack and when notions of objectivity and of a free press and of facts and of evidence are trying to be undermined. And in fact, what happened is a fact-free world has been created. And I tell you how it works. So basically, you know this kind of situation. You're standing in front of the building and glass windows are reflecting what's behind you. And you can't see what's actually happening behind those windows. And that was actually the place where the government of the GDR <coughs> was located. And uh, so that's why <laughs> this picture refers is really symbolic. And so basically, in order for people not to see who is pulling the strings and what's going on in the world, you create those reflections to distract people and see those things that you wanted to see. And this is what public media are for, you know, and social media. And it's pretty effective in distracting us from the real problems and what's really going on and who's the community power for selfish reasons and all these kind of things. And I think it's time to say stop. Not just because I don't like it, but for scientific 
reasons. Because society cannot be steered like a car. Interaction is checking everything, you know, as these central traffic trends are showing. Even if we knew the songs of all the people, if we had perfect mind reading and perfect surveillance, this wouldn't avoid traffic jams. I can tell this because we have mathematical models for this, and they say that if you go beyond a certain critical density, then small variations in the speed will be amplified. There would be a cascading effect, and that creates a situation that nobody wants. Everyone tries to avoid it. These people have all the data they need, they have good technology, they have good education, they hold the driver's license, but still they fail. And they fail for a reason, because here we are confronted with a situation of systemic instability, as it occurs in many complex systems. Here is another example. In Saudi Arabia, there is this annual pilgrimage, the Hajj, and they used 5,000 CCTV cameras to be sure everything would be safe. It didn't help. Perfect surveillance, you would think. But the cause disaster happened in 2015. It happened because optimization was applied. Optimization in the sense of minimizing actually travel times. And that created counter flows, and those counter flows created the disaster. So we need to be very careful about how to use surveillance and optimization. In fact, in complex systems, a paradigm of more power is better off the fails. Now, how is power being created today? It's created by the principle of DD and Impera. I can conquer, but that cannot unify the world. Information asymmetry, you know, that government collects all the data we have done, or Google collects all the data, we have very little data. But that creates a totalitarian state, and we know that uh, in evolutionary systems, actually, symmetric interaction creates optimal outcomes, not asymmetric. And finally, the dimensional money system also creates a top-down control system. Now, I would be fine with that if that top-down control would work. But it doesn't. It's not suited for many complex systems. Too much power just destroys systems, like the elephant in the porcelain shop, basically. You know. In fact, we've learned that the measure that increased safety of airplane flights most was to allow co-pilots to question the action of the pilot. We've learned that the Fukushima atomic disaster was a result of people not questioning authority. They were too obedient. And we also know that the United States is the most powerful country on earth, but after September 11, that power didn't help much because things went pretty much wrong in Afghanistan and Iraq. International tension spread, created a terrible situation in Syria. Terrorism spread, it created a refugee crisis and all this. So that's a cascading effect that extended over many years and made the situation on this globe pretty much uncontrollable. And that's basically the experiment that shows the mechanism behind it. So if you have a systemic instability, then a local perturbation could actually mess up the entire system as a result of chain reactions. We find that in real systems too. Like the financial crisis, how Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, and then after this, hundreds of banks went bankrupt too. It was a cascading effect that created losses of hundreds of billions of dollars. And in fact, many unsolved problems of the world relate to complexity and system instability, like tragedies of the commons, where cooperation would be desirable, but it's unstable, like this free traffic flow. And that's why cooperation erodes and creates a tragedy of the commons. 
unstable supply chains and other problems, we find that even on global scale, booms and recessions right. of the world economy, crowd disasters, um, crime, conflict, revolutions, all of that is based on systemic instability and complex dynamics. So what I'd like to say is we need more wisdom rather than more power. And I can, we can understand how to go about it if we look at our body. Our body is a complex analytical system too. And so if we want to heal a disease, we know that we need to find the right medicine. We need to apply the right dose at the right time. Too much medicine would actually be poisonous. There could be side effects. There would be interaction effects between different drugs, and if we would take so many drugs, we would surely become ill or die. So if we apply too many measures at the same time, you know, this is a recipe to create chaos. We need minimally invasive measures. Well, some people say, no, we, we shouldn't have people interfere with political decision making because decentralization implies a price of anarchy. A centralized system would be the most efficient system. It would create the best solutions. This is true for some systems, but not all. There are empty hard and empty complete problems that cannot be solved in real time. In particular, there are complex dynamical systems which it doesn't work well, including even traffic light control. And we need to have a look at these curves over here. So certainly we now have uh, data to take better decisions, but actually the data volume is overtaking the processing power, because in just a year we're producing as much data as in all the years before, as in the entire history of humankind. So it's almost unimaginable. And this gap between data and processing power is increasing ever more. It means that there's dark data that we can never process. It means that we need science to know what data to look at and how to process it. Science is back. Chris Anderson is wrong. And um, systemic complexity is exploding as we go on networking the world. And that is increasing combinatorially. It means it's even overtaking data volume, and that's why top-down control gets increasingly lost. You listen to the World Economics Forum speeches, and you know this is the state the world is in. <laughs> so we need another control paradigm, which is distributed control. In fact, if you want to have a well-performing complex system, then you need to give the units of that system, some degree of autonomy. And if you want to avoid those dangerous cascading effects, then we need to decentralize the world. We need more global designs. Um, we see, need distributed control. We need subsidiarity. So I'd like to say we cannot solve our problems with the same kind of thinking that created them. This is a quote by Albert Einstein. It's not the right paradigm to assume that we need a better monitoring data that we try to optimize the world and then tell everyone what to do, you know. This word would have to be there, that's the idea. Everyone would be told, you and you and you, everyone would be told by that monstrous computer algorithm what you would need to do in order to fulfill this gigantic plan of the world's optimization. This is wrong because optimization works only if you could really optimize the world in real time, if you could identify the right goal function to optimize, but there's no science to do this, you know? Would it be GDP per capita or sustainability? Would it be power or peace that you should optimize? Would it be life expectancy or happiness? Or uh, what should be it? We don't know. We will only know later on. And that's why complex society need pluralism to strive, to be prepared for all sorts of situations that would unexpectedly come upon us. 
and there would be many different approaches and solutions that maximizes societal resilience that needs survival of people. Pluralism is needed. Innovation is needed, you know. In fact, Lego would be the right paradigm. Lego gives you so many opportunities to build all sorts of systems with the same, same ingredients. You know, this Bentham uh, approach basically would tell everyone what you would get, how much food, what kind of food, uh, at one time, all these kind of things, and tell you how to use it you now. Now, I mean, the success of our society is built on the freedom to use those ingredients in different ways. And that creates co-evolution. That creates progress, basically. And so, the right paradigm for a society, as compared to a company, is evolution and empowerment. So I've said that, well, you know, enabling users, customers, and citizens will lead to better services, better products, better business, better neighborhoods, smarter citizens, smarter societies. And yet, yeah, we should go for combinatorial innovation because we need much more innovation in a very short time in order to solve our problems. So we need to create an open and participative information, innovation, production, and service ecosystem. Open data is needed to support better decisions, to enable participation that means digital democracy, to create new jobs that means to fuel the digital economy. And that's why we have started to work on an alternative paradigm. And nervous at this platform. And I'd like to invite you all to participate in this. So this is inspired by Linux, by Wikipedia, by OpenStreetMap. It's a community project. And we create our own data using smartphones, which have a lot of sensors in them, connecting those smartphones together in order to create a global measurement system that give us data to work with. And we would like to have a system that we can trust. Right? That's why citizens should actually control it, should be a web of the people. There should be an information system controlled by you, where you decide what sensor to open and whether you want to use that data just for yourself or share it. You should have personal data stores, you should have a participatory system. And NerdSnet is working on this. There are three levels of engagement, which is data production in a crowdsourced way. Data analytics, because that data would be made available. And you can also come up with your Internet of Things apps that would serve in that real time stream of data. It could be games, it could be services, it could be digital products, whatever. So, NerdSnet could do a lot of things for us. It could uh, create real time measurement, increase awareness, support digital democracy, and the future economy and self organizing systems. And yes, I think we need to start to map resources and who uses them. We've built a simple app that is extended, small files. You know, here you can do geolocated measurements and uh, put geolocated photos or videos. So basically, we could jointly map the world. That's the idea on the long run. I could also create compasses for decision makers that could make things visible that we can't see or hear or feel, such as social capital, you know, reputation, trust, solidarity. Very important for our society, but so far we have no good idea how much to bear and why. Real time measurements. Yes, we can now measure externalities and external effects in direction people, companies, with environments, so we can have noise and uh, stress and other externalities, emissions, but also positive things, you know, like happiness, cooperation, new jobs and all this. So if we would give it a price or a value, that would help us to take better decisions, come up with better innovations, and build uh, something like the earthquake detectors together crowdsourced sensing, and we can create 
digital assistance altogether. In fact, since Elinor Ostrom, the Nobel Prize winner, we know that self government is efficient if you just have proper design principles. So this is where computational social science comes in. You know, tell politicians, tell us what should be the mechanisms to create cooperation, coordination, creativity, innovation, all these kinds of things. You know. But the paradigm is not this central super control center that tells everyone what to do, but to have digital assistance that support our decisions. A system that you can turn on or off, where you can say what's your goal, where the system would offer you alternatives, you would choose, the system would help you to achieve your goal. And in fact, we could build these systems actually for disaster response, right? So if the world is heading towards disaster, then we should have systems that help to help ourselves and to help others in our neighborhood. And we can build these systems, decentralized systems, and these systems should be able to keep up communication even if the public communication system is down. So there should be an ad hoc networking opportunity between smartphones. And we should have a payment system in our smartphones that would allow us to keep up some economic activity, like an elementary sharing economy, and should have a reputation system to reward responsible behavior, and a qualification system that decides who can have what kind of functionality and how much data it has, to make sure the system wouldn't be misused. And we could build powerful assistance to help us to have a better overview of the situation we are in and support our interaction with others. And in fact, we need also tools for digital democracy. In a world that is so complex that no single individual, also no supercomputer, can fully understand, we need to embrace collective intelligence. We need to bring the best ideas and the knowledge of many minds together, you know, artificial intelligence systems too, by the way. So that requires online deliberation platforms where you, everyone can put their arguments on a table with it. those arguments can be structured into different perspectives and then a round table will try to integrate those different perspectives to come up with innovative solutions that would help many different people, you know, that would allow for this combinatorial innovation. Solutions are work for many companies and many stakeholders and interest groups. That's the main point. Pluralistic solutions. And in fact, we know that diversity wins. That's kind of the success principle of collective intelligence. Not the best individual solution is the best, it turns out. And this is what digital democracy is about. It's about embracing value pluralism to allow not just one thing to happen, but many different things. And of course also we need to think about our economy. And now it's possible to build a liberal, democratic, participatory, social, and ecological economy by combining the Internet of Things with blockchain technology and complexity science. We know that economic growth in the world is coming to a whole because of the level of inequality that we've reached. You can see it over here. And that's a very serious problem. You know. So what do we need to do to get to the next level of our economy and society? When the old success principles like administration, optimization, globalization have reached their limit. We need to engage in new success principles, success principles that are made for a networked economy and society, and this is co-creation, co-evolution, and collective intelligence. And in fact, you know, there's a serious problem. The ECB and other central banks are pumping trillions of money into the system to, in order to restart the world economy, but they didn't succeed. And now they're thinking about helicopter money, basically putting some money on your bank account in a bottom-up way, bottom-up infusion of money, because this other approach didn't work. And in fact, I have a proposal that's along these lines. 
and that would unleash the power of this unlimited digital economy. Because that is the real value of this digital economy. It's un not material and therefore unlimited if we don't limit it by the kind of intellectual property rights that we impose on that kind of system. It's now possible actually to create money in a bottom up way. Bitcoin has shown that. The technology is there. But we need to go away from that one dimensional money and control system. We need to have a multi dimensional incentive and reward system in order to be able to embrace self organization of complex systems. We know complex systems cannot be controlled by one variable, it fails. We see that feature. So we really need to come up with a, a new paradigm. And now we, we can actually create a situation 300 years after the invisible hand has been invented. We can make it work with the Internet of Things and complex designs. We can introduce feedback loops. We can introduce them on multiple levels that leaves enough freedom for creativity and innovation on the bottom levels. So that's kind of the alternative paradigm to the top-down control. And we've shown actually that this allows to get rid of traffic jams in many cases. So a decentralized control approach, which just changes the interaction between cars, allows to stabilize the traffic flow and get rid of the problem. We've applied the same principle actually to cities. Again, a decentralized control approach, bottom up where traffic flows control the traffic lights rather than the other way around is much more efficient if you do it the right way. So as compared to the top-down controlled state-of-the-art approaches, you can be much better because this is a flexible, adaptive approach that's better suited for complex and ample systems. And that's the reason why decentralized approaches are spending also in other systems like smart grid, in um, smart contracts also, industry 4.0. And I think that will also be the basis finally of the circle, circular economy that we bitterly need. You know, if we run out of resources on this planet, then we need to reuse those resources. We need to build a circular economy rather than supply chain. And that requires this differentiated incentive and reward system that can now be built, as I have proposed here. So I say we can and we need to build better systems for a better future. Yes, it's fine to use big data, but it should be open, participatory, and fair. We should use artificial intelligence, but in a symbiotic and ethical way. Incentive systems are fine and needed, but they need to be multidimensional. And if we build an operating system for society, it should leave creative freedoms and possibilities for self organization self-regulation and coordination. And what we need to do in order to avoid this global disaster the Club of Rome has predicted is change the equations, change the socioeconomic framework that can now be done. We can build a circular economy. The technology is finally there, and we need to do this. And so this is how I imagine the world to work in the future. We shouldn't see it as one huge clockwork that's centrally controlled, but it should be a network well-coordinated distributed system of largely autonomous systems. So in conclusion, we combine smart technologies with smart citizens, it will create smarter cities and societies. Thank you.
Derek, you've written recently about democracy 2.0. Yes. But you didn't actually mention it. Would you spare some moments? That Absolutely. So, um, democracy is always what I refer to here in my talk um, as digital democracy. Digital democracy has recently been discredited by a Huffington Post article that totally got it wrong, I should say. You know, um, it's really about creating collective intelligence. That means creating tools that would allow us to combine distributed knowledge that's available around the world including artificial intelligence systems and integrate that knowledge to come up with better solutions. Solutions that wouldn't just maximize one goal function, but it would be oriented at trying to come up with solutions that work for many, many different stakeholders with different goal functions. So you wouldn't choose one goal like GDP per capita or whatever you are interested in and then go for 100% maximum solution because then you have this one solution and the implication is the fact that everyone will have to do one thing. But now since we have built culture and societies, this has happened because we're not just caring about food to survive, but we have learned to care about many other things. So you would optimize this one dimension, just say 90%. And then there may be thousands of solutions that have this 90% of performance in terms of GDP per capita. But then among those thousands of solutions, there are many solutions uh, that would be able to unleash other dimensions. So un unleash this combinatorial innovation. That, that's really important, right? So come up with solutions that work for many. And uh, I know People are sometimes talking badly about compromises, but in fact, this pluralism and the balance of power and the compromises are not a back of modern societies. It, you know, if, if it's done well, professionally, you know, and also with digital tools, it, it's a solution. It's a it's a feature and not a back. And we have forgotten about this. You know this. When you want to be I think is a terrible misunderstanding and the plurality is really important to unleash all that evolutionary opportunities that the world is offering us in the economy and in the society. We know that the most diverse economies are actually the most successful ones. And we know that evolution creates an increase in diversity and it has a reason. Just we need to learn how to deal with that diversity better and how to turn it into an advantage for our economy and our society. And that requires this digital assistance to help us with the, to, to turn diversity and complexity into a benefit. Yeah, question about so in one of the last slides you mentioned capitalism 2.0. Right. right. Uh, you said, I fully embrace the idea of this bottom up a self organizing society, but the point is that how would you cope that you know, a, a, a capitalist 2.0 does not provide the, the high level of inequality that we have today that kills diversity actually in our society? That there wouldn't be anyhow a future to uh, somehow have some, the right incentives to, to avoid the huge amount of uh, inequality we have set today. Right. So, I mean, uh, it is obvious, I think, by now to everyone that capitalism 1.0, the capitalism we have today, is running into a trap. It's becoming dangerous for people because it's clear that it creates a money flow from the bottom to the top, and there are less and less people who have more and more money, and that means there's less money left for us, and there would be people who would not be able to pay for food and things to survive, right? I'm not worried about people being rich, I'm worried about those people who couldn't survive any longer. And so it's immoral to sustain a system that doesn't work any longer. So how can we change that? Uh, even within today's framework, we just add new dimensions of value, you know, we could come up with ecological currencies, social currency, there's all sorts of currency you could measure, you could turn each externality to a currency in a sense, um, and thereby 
it would create opportunities uh, for people and countries uh, to be rich in different ways. So you could specialize in social currency. You could be rich in ecological currency, you know. And other people could be rich on the currency that we have today, so it would still exist, you know, the money system of the day. We wouldn't take it away, we would add something to it. And uh, so that would create opportunities to uh, basically unfold opportunities that we haven't unfolded in the past. So as you measure externalities and share this data with others, you would earn money in exchange. So money would be created in a bottom-up way. And the amount of money wouldn't be limited, strictly speaking. So it doesn't need to be a redistribution. I'm not saying the rich should give their money to us. I just say let us allow us to create new value in a bottom-up way and to live on it, you know. And that money would eventually rise to the top. That's fine, you know. I, I don't worry about that. Um, but the point is we need a system that works for everyone and can be built. And I think the resources of the world are enough for everyone if you build a circular economy and people wouldn't have to die if we just change the socio-economic framework in the way I suggested that we have to do that now, otherwise we're running in deep, deep trouble and our life is in danger, I can tell you. Okay, I, I, I have to stop this very nice discussion because I think there are some interesting stuff like, you know, how to plug biological systems which are self-regulating uh, in an unbiased, in a biased situation like the social one. But that, that could be a long discussion. But we can do at the end when Carlo Claudio will uh, give his conclusions. There will be more space for discussion, but I have now to, first of all, thank you. It's wonderful. Uh, Thank you.